we're on. Okay. Well, James the Montgomery Boyce has said that these chapters, uh, Romans chapters 9 to 11, are uh, very rarely preached on. In fact, um, in his opinion, they're preached on more infrequently than end times theology uh, because they're so hard to understand. Uh, and in fact, uh, some say they shouldn't even be there. They would just assume, cut, cut those chapters out, just take the end of eight, zip it right to the beginning of 12 and be good to go. Um, others say it's a big parenthesis that Paul was going on a tangent. But not for us, right? Because we know that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for us. These are hard chapters that we're going to get into in the next few weeks. But we're going to trust the Lord. And we're going to trust his wisdom. We're going to trust that he's going to enlighten us. Not necessarily the words that I say. But um, also just that, that God will be teaching all of us. Each and every one of us. Um, so uh, we just came off of, in my opinion, one of the greatest chapters in scripture. I love Romans 8. Where Paul just so excitingly talks about uh, those the, that gold the, that that unbreakable chain of God's saving works, and uh, he was in the process of 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 just being so excited to tell us that God is you know fashioning us for our eternal home, and each day He's drawing us closer, He's clicking us closer to eternity, and and drawing our hearts closer to Him, uh, and He's making our character more like Him, um, and 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 maybe um, also working uh, in our thinking to align our thoughts more in line with God's perspective, God's view on this world, right? To live the values of the kingdom in the here and now, uh, because we know that Jesus will return. He will return soon to recreate heaven and earth. And um, and so we, we live that reality. And Paul has been reassuring us and assuring us that our salvation is held by the power of the almighty God of the universe. And that, you know, that beautiful chapter, that beautiful verse, Romans eight twenty eight, that in all things, all things in our lives, the good and the bad, that God is purpose for us, that we would know him better, that through the ups and downs of life that God would be um, increasing our faith and um, making the kingdom of heaven more a reality and the glory that awaits us in our eternal home. Um, and we trust him. We trust him through the circumstances in life. We walk with him knowing that God's will will be done and we can find rest and peace through all the circumstances in life because um, we know that, and we learn in Romans chapter 8, that both God the Son and God the Spirit are praying for us according to God's will. So we know that no matter what happens, there is nothing uh, uh, in heaven or on earth. There's no power. There's no authority. There's no principality. There's no demonic influence. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that can ever separate us from the love of God, right? Because he's got us in the palm of his hands, right? And, and we know that you know, we, we know that all his promises are uh, sure, that is our hope, that we will see all of God's promises, they are true, and we will see them come true, uh, right? That is our confidence, that is our hope, because we know that God will, he will uh, fulfill everything that he's promised, because uh, he always finishes what he starts. So Paul goes from this, like, excited high uh, about who we are in Christ to this, you sense the shift in, in chapter 9, that um, he declares his uh, anguish and his sadness for his fellow Jews who have, um, by and large, rejected Jesus. Not all Jews rejected Jesus, because we know from our study in, of Acts that many in the first century uh, Christian church were Jewish by, by origin, um, but for the most part, most Jews and the Jews in general had rejected uh, Jesus and the spiritual life in Christ and um, and 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 uh, eternal life. So, Paul, we see this in uh, verses one to four. He says, Paul says, "I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the whole in in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart." For I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. They should have, and the reason he has that anguish is they should have received Jesus with joy, 
they should have recognized him as God's promised Messiah, right? And they should have recognized that Jesus was God's way in uh, bringing salvation, that going to the cross was God's plan all along. They should have seen it because their whole life, their whole culture, their whole religious um, system was all centered on the promised Messiah and looking for the anointed one to bring uh, salvation. They had great privileges. Uh, it was a great privilege for them to be born Jewish. And let's go on. They, Paul points out the privilege. Theirs is the adoption as sons. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs from them who has traced the human ancestry of Jesus, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Right? So they should have seen, because they had these great privileges, theirs is the adoption, Paul says, and not adoption in the individual sense, the way we know that when we are in Christ, we are individually adopted into God's family. He's talking as a nation. They were adopted as God's sons, um, as, as Abraham, and God called Abraham out and formed the nation of Israel, this elect nation through whom God would bring salvation through. Theirs is a divine glory. We know that from our study of Exodus with Moses. We saw that God's presence was with Israel, that he took his people and he, through powerful miracles, he rescued them out of the oppression of Egypt. He brought them, uh, remember, he brought them uh, to, uh, to, to the sea, to the Red Sea, and with one, you know, with one wave, he eliminated the entire, uh, the most powerful army on earth, the Egyptian army, right? So, um, and then we know that God's presence, his divine glory went with them. They, he guided them through the, the desert to the promised land, right? Remember that cloud by day and that pillar of fire by, by night. And then, you know, God gave them the, the plans for the tabernacle. They built the tabernacle. God's presence, that cloud rested on the tabernacle, right? The same with the temple. We saw that last year when Solomon built the temple. Um, and we saw that. So theirs was the divine presence. Um, theirs was the covenant. God made special promises, uh, a special relationship with the Jews. First to Abraham, those promises, that covenant passed down to his son Isaac and to Jacob and to Moses and to David, right? God gave them um, the law, right? We know that God gave them his very own words, the whole of the Old Testament, right? That was uh, God's word to them. God gave the law to Moses. We saw that. Uh, in our study of Exodus, and God also gave, like we saw last year when we studied the prophets, God spoke to them through the prophets, God's very word spoken through the prophets, right? Um, theirs is the temple worship. We saw um, that God had arranged worship um, in allowing sinful man to approach a holy God. That was through those religious rituals, through the sacrifices, through the, through the festivals, um, that was all, and we know uh, that that was all pointing to the coming Messiah, to Jesus, right? Those were the promises, the promises that were given to the patriarchs, right? Um, the, the, um, again, the, the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, um, and then going on uh, through... Um, uh, Moses and David, right? Remember, we saw through David the promise that was given to to him that uh, that he would have a king sit on his throne that, that whose kingdom would never end. You know that was, of course, Jesus, um, and the um, of course the uh, human, uh, of course, humanly speaking, uh, he was he came through David's line. So, you know, no other culture or nation on the face of the planet could ever claim this special relationship that God had, the God Almighty Creator of heaven and earth had with the Jews. They were so privileged in such good ways. Um, the problem was that the, the church uh, in Rome, and I'm sure churches across the, the region, were confused because if the Jews had these great pri privileges uh, given to them, um, how come that they would expect to see that the churches in the area would be largely made up of Jews with maybe a few Gentiles? But in fact, they saw the opposite. The churches were made up of mostly Gentiles with a few Jews. And, you know, so why did the Jews um, reject 
Jesus uh, for the large part. Not all again, um, but, but for the most part they did. Um, and that is because we know from our history that they were suffering tremendously under Roman oppression. Um, and they wanted relief. They wanted salvation uh, from um, the oppression that they suffered under the Roman Empire. And so when they read the Old Testament, you know, of course, what jumped out at them was the line of prophecy that the Messiah would be the, would come as the conquering king and would reign forever and would, you know, bring salvation. And so, you know, they, they liked that conquering king line of prophecy, um, but they kind of ignored uh, that second line of prophecy that talked about how the Messiah would be the suffering servant and would die for the sins of the people. Um, and, you know, it, it, we have to be careful because we can do the same thing. You know, we, um, at times, I think we can do the same thing. I think it's our natural human tendency to like some parts of scripture and, tr and ignore others. You know, but God wants all us to receive all of his scripture as a whole. It is good for us. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's convicting. Sometimes God uh, will show us things in the word um, that take courage for us to face and have strength and fortitude. Um, right? Because he's, but it's all for our good because he's drawing us closer to him. He's get, showing us more his heart and um, preparing us for for our eternal home. Um, and so we can see uh, that, you know, there were, there are two comings of the Messiah. We can see that because we look back on Jesus's first coming, um, right? So we, we just had Christmas. We just came through the Christmas season. So we were reminded that Jesus came um, to peasant parents. He was meek and humble and, and really a nobody carpenter, right? Um, and, he, and he, of course, he died uh, for our sins. And um, not, you know, now we know that that death on the cross was the opening of the gates of heaven. And we know that because Jesus fulfilled each and every prophecy to the T of his first coming, we know and have confidence that he will fulfill all the prophecies in his second coming. So he will come back. He will be the, the conquering king. He will conquer Satan. He will uh, judge evil. All evil will be judged and he will sit on the throne. His throne will last forever and every single person will see and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, whether willingly or unwillingly, because we know that scripture says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So, um, so Paul here, you know, Paul is one who could talk about Jewish privilege because if you go back and read, and I would recommend you go back and read um, uh, Philippians 3, uh, he talks about in verses uh, 4 through 10, he talks about his own um, uh, testimony where he was one who had tremendous privilege and prestige in the Jewish community. He was a rising star, a rising Pharisee. He had money, he had influence, he had power. He probably could have been, you know, one of the greatest Pharisees of all time. He studied under one of them. Um, and, and, and he was on that track. He had the world at his fingertips, right? But we know that in Philippians, he says that all that, everything that the world had to offer is as dung compared to knowing Jesus and the, even the fellowship of his sufferings and all the spiritual blessings in Christ and the eternal life to come. Like that so far outweighs anything that this world has to offer us. And so that is why, and that's one of the reasons he anguished for his fellow Jews because they were still in Adam. And Paul remembered what it was like to be in Adam. So his heart broke for them. And what's really phenomenal, if you ask me, is that as I read it, the Jews were no friends to him. Like they look, they were his enemies. I mean, for all intents and purposes, right? They, they, they stoned him. They left him for dead. They flogged him. They um, imprisoned him, right? But Paul did not see them as his enemies. His heart broke for them. They were lost without Christ. And that was the most important thing. If, unless they turned, their destiny would be the hideousness of hell. And Paul, just he loved them so much. And I, I think it's a testimony, a tremendous testimony to his, the depth of his relationship with Jesus um, and also his confidence 
uh, in God's kingdom that he would hurt so much for them that he would actually trade places with them spiritually, which is, again, phenomenal because, you know, I don't know about you guys, but, um, you know, I have a hard time just even praying for people that have wronged me. And I ashamedly admit that in no way have people wronged me as much as Paul was wronged by the Jews. I mean, it's like comparing, you know, having your legs cut off to a hangnail. You know, I mean, what do I have to complain about, right? Um, and, and so I, I, I'm not there. Um, but again, I think it's um, uh, allow, you know, to die for someone physically is we might do that for our loved ones, right? Uh, but to change places with somebody spiritually, I mean, that's just phenomenal. We know that that can't happen from our study of Romans. That is, that is impossible. But Paul loved them so much and he cared for them so much that he would do that. And again, it's extraordinary. It goes to his the depth of his relationship with Jesus. I think that his heart for those that pursued him to try to destroy him and kill him, the fact that he loved them so much and his heart broke for them, um, I think it goes back to that experience that he had where he, it, we, we believe it was him, that he died and experienced heaven and then came back. I really believe that that motivated him every minute of every day. Um, so it's phenomenal. And that's what we want, right? Lord, more of you, less of me, right? <laughs> that's what we want. So Paul, at this point, hears three objections. I'm going to go through each one. The three objections are, verse 6, well, has God's word failed? Has God broken his promises to the Jews? That's the first objection. And then the second one, verse 14, well, is God fair? And the third, or is he unfair? Is he unjust? And then the third objection um, is in verse 18. Well, how, how can um, God blame people? And so I'm going to go through each of those. Um, and so again, we know that Paul knows what people are thinking. He's, he's writing this huge long letter to the church in Rome, but he's done probably decades of preaching at this point. He knows and debating and he knows and talking with people and he knows people's hearts and he knows what people are thinking. So um, he's going to address what he is anticipating what they are thinking. So <clears throat> verse six. Um, so um, but ba basically what they're saying is um, because the, the common understanding at that time was if you were born Jewish, then you were automatically saved. You were automatically in the kingdom of God. That was the common understanding of the day that by nationality you are saved. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Um, and th but, 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 th but you can understand why they would object because if, 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 if God made promises to the Jews that they would be saved in their understanding and um, well, is God faithful? Is he breaking his promise? Be and, that, and that was important to them because they needed to know that because if God is breaking a promise to, to the Jewish people, then how can I be sure of God's promises to me being in Christ? Like all that, 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 <clears throat> that chain of God's, God's sovereign works to bring us to salvation, is he going to break those promises too? That's where they were coming from. And Paul saying, no, 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 no. It is not as though God's word has failed, verse 6, uh, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, not because they are his descendants are they Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children. Um, they had the one and the same father, our, our, our father Isaac. And yet before the twins were born or had any and done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, so this is to Rebecca, God told Rebecca, the older will, will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Right, so Paul is in the process of saying, no, 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 no. Throughout the whole Old Testament, salvation has always been by faith, through faith, right? And, and, and we go back to Abraham, right? We remember from our study earlier in the year that Abraham was not declared right with God. He was not declared righteous because of his obedience or his works or his circumcision. Remember, Abraham was declared right by God by faith. Right. And so Paul's saying it's always been that way. Right. So people in the Old Testament times looked ahead and trusted in God's coming Messiah to make them right. And that's how they were saved. But 
you know, just in the same way that we look back and we see Jesus, you know, Christ on the cross, we're like, yes, that's, that, that's by God's grace through faith. That is our salvation. So it's the same. They looked forward, we look back. But God, and we know that, and so he goes through and he's like, look, God made the promise to Abraham, right? And we remember from our study in Genesis that Abraham, um, he was very old when God called him. God promised him that he would have children. God promised nations would come from him. God promised to bless all the earth through him, right? We know that that's through Messiah, uh, through God's promised Messiah. Um, and um, we remember that, you know, Abraham and Sarah uh, got a little impatient. And so they thought they could help God out. And they took matters into their own hands. And Abraham slept with uh, Sarah's uh, handmaiden and she bore, the handmaiden bore him uh, um, Ishmael, right? And God was like, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. The, uh, the promise one is not going to be through Ishmael. That's, you know, representative of man's way. It's not going to be an act of man. It's going to be a supernatural miracle act of God. Sarah will give birth. God came through on that promise. She, she had Isaac, right? Isaac grew up. The promises that God made to, um, to Abraham um, transferred to Isaac. Isaac then uh, gave birth to uh, twins, but before the twins were born, God told Rebecca, the older will serve the younger. In other words, it was, you know, commonplace that the blessing, the, the, the inheritance will go to the oldest, right? Um, but in this case, God chose the young one and the youngest and God's choosing didn't depend on what he did or didn't do because it was before he was even born, right? So, um, you know, so, uh, and if it was up to Isaac, if you go back and read the story, Isaac would have chosen Esau to receive the blessing, right? Because he was the man's man. Just like when we studied last year and we, uh, Samuel was told that the king of Israel would come from Jesse's sons. One of Jesse's sons would be the king of Israel. And when Samuel had it, J Jesse line up his sons and he sees you know, David's oldest brother and Samuel's first response is, yes, he must be the king. He looks like a king. This must be God's anointed. And God's like, no, 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 no. Man looks at outward appearance. God looks at the heart. That is not the one I chose. I chose one that is not even here. So they had even forgotten about David. David was out in the field. They're like, oh yeah, go get, what's his name? I forgot about him. So, but God, David was God's anointed. David was the one that God chose the same way. God chose Jacob for God's reasons, God chose Jacob, not Esau. Um, so again, the Jews were, con uh, the, the Roman church was confused um, in God choosing Jacob. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated for whatever reason. God chose to set his affection on Jacob. God chose to bring the blessing through Jacob, through Jacob's line that all Jews, and so it's not all Jews are saved, not because they're not saved because they're Jewish, um, that, you know, like in, you know, in our country, sometimes people think just because they're born into a Christian nation, they're a Christian, or just because they go to church, they're a Christian. Well, we know from our study of Romans, that does not make us a Christian. Um, but, you know, it's being, uh, you know, by God's grace, through faith in Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, that was the reason that Jesus' sacrifice was the one acceptable from, by God. Um, for the forgiveness of our sins. So honestly, I have to talk, I have to be honest with you. I struggle with this teaching. This is a hard teaching. Um, I, in my limited thinking, in my limited brain, if God elects some to eternal life and to be made alive in Christ, then does He not choose others? You know, and this is hard. We struggle with this, um, right? Because you know, it's not that God destines anyone from hell, for hell, right? We all deserve hell, so we're all going there. It's just that God chooses some to be made alive in Christ and passes over others. And, you know, we, we need to have uh, humility in acknowledging that we can't fully understand the mind of God or the acts of God in the, the how or the why that God chooses. Um, but, you know, it's, it's both... It's both awesome and horrifying. God's choosing is both awesome and horrifying at the same time. And I just, I can't wrap my brain around it. I, to, I'm honest with you, I struggle with it. Um, but naturally, then the objection is, well, is God fair? Is God fair in his choosing? Maybe he's not fair in how he chooses, right? Because we bring 
uh, naturally, our human tendency is to bring our own issues and our own baggage and our own experiences, right? In, in, in our own thinking, this kind of kind of clouds our judgment, right? Because by nature, you know, by our flesh, um, we have to admit, if we're honest, we admit that we want to do the choosing. We don't want to be chosen. Um, we want to be in control. We want the power, right? Or at least we think uh, we think we do, um, right? Um, or we want to completely understand the process, right? How does God choose? I want to make sure that it is fair. And I struggle on a whole nother level. Like, I feel like I have survivor skill. Like, I feel so bad. Like, why would God choose me? Like, I feel so bad for people that aren't chosen. Like, my heart breaks for them, right? And then somehow, you know, sometimes I walk around with like this prideful arrogance, like, yeah, God chose me. Uh, isn't he glad that he chose me? Um, and then other times I'm like such a mess and I fall and I fall hard and I feel like I'm so unworthy. Why would God choose me? You know, and I just, I feel like I have to work in my flesh to, um, to please God or for him to be glad, not disappointed that he chose me. I'm such a mess, <laughs> such a mess. It's my baggage, trust me. But it's not what the word says because I have to go back to the word. And we see in chapter, in verse 14, of course, chapter nine, verse 14, uh, God says, uh, what then shall we say? Is God unfair? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or man's effort, but on God's mercy. Oh, okay, it's all his mercy. All and, and, and Paul, I think at this point, he wants us to find awe and comfort in election. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to not understand. It's okay to feel unsettled and have and have questions. God, he's not afraid of your questions. He wants you to commune with him. He wants you to banter with him and talk with him about it and lay your heart out before him because he'll answer you. He will answer you in his time. And that's what I say to myself. I'm like, well, God, I'm, I'm kind of confused. I don't get it. Um, I don't have all the answers. I don't see it now, um, but I'm going to trust you, right? And I'm going to, and, I, and I, I pray, God, help me to see from your perspective because I don't see it right now. And then I trust that God will answer that prayer. He will give me more insight uh, into his perspective, um, in his ways and in his timing, when the timing is right, right? So um, until he shows me, I decide that I'm going to walk by faith and I'm going to trust him and I want to trust his word and I go back to what I know about God, what he says about himself in his word, right? That he's all good. He's good all the time. He's loving. Um, he is fair. He's trustworthy. He's wise. He's right. He's majestic. He's magnificent and he's awesome in all that he does in all his ways, right? So God made the world. He directs the world, right? He's moving the world toward his ends, right? And it's all for his pleasure. His choosing, he is all for his pleasure and all for his glory, right? And, and I just, I have to humbly acknowledge that God is not accountable to me. He does not have to explain himself to me, right? Or meet my ex standards or my expectations. No, because he's the holy God. He can do whatever he wants and he's right and it's okay. It's okay, right? And in fact, um, God is so good to us. He gives us more insight into his choosing, uh, verse 17, he says that, um, to, as in, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens who he wants to harden. Whew. Okay, so God raised up Pharaoh. Scripture tells us God hardened Pharaoh's heart for God's purposes, which we know God's highest purpose is to display his character and glorify himself. Um, that is God's highest purpose to bring glory to himself, to his name. And we know from our study of last year, it's very exciting, uh, right in the beginning, right? When, when, when God brought the Jewish people right up to the wall of Jericho, right? Why did Rahab, the Canaanite pagan, prostitute, nobody who lived in the wall, why did she help the Jewish spies, right? She did because she heard the powerful, almighty, one true God, almighty creator of the universe was with them. 
and had helped them miraculously, right? And she believed and she revered the name of God, God's holy name. So now this is a tough teaching because whether people receive Jesus, whether they receive God and new life in him, or whether they reject Jesus, God will be glorified. That's hard. That's hard for us. And we see that, that God in his love and his graciousness and his mercy to us, we get to see that God in hardening Pharaoh's heart, God used Rahab and, um, and, and, and God glorified his name through her. And she went on to be in the line of Christ. Jesus, Jesus great, 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 you know, one of the great, 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 great grandmother. Praise the Lord, right? God is so good. Um, so, and, and, and also when people are in rebellion to God. So there's many things that God does behind the scenes that we are not privy to. We do not have access to. We are limited to. We don't see what God is doing uh, through people's rebellions and through the hardness of heart. But one of the things we know um, from scripture is that um, God patiently, we saw that all last year, with the history of Israel, right? God patiently and lovingly bore with his people. He was so patient um, in their rebellion and that brought glory to God, right? So God, in God's choosing, in God's hardening, in God's ways, um, his grace is on display, his mercy is on display, his loving kindness, his patience, Right, even uh, in the darkness, and I, I think about today in our culture right now, in our country, and the darkness that is being revealed and the evil that's being revealed right now makes me so angry. The fact, though, that Jesus does not come right now, this very minute, and is phenomenal. He is showing patient restraint, right? Because why? Because more people have to come into the kingdom. God's name will be glorified in all things, right? The evil, the good, the hardening. God's name will be glorified. Uh, verse 19. Um, so the next objection, well, is basically, well, if Pharaoh was just a puppet, well then, how can God blame him? How can God blame us for being in rebellion, right? But I do not believe that we are puppets, okay? Um, I do believe that we have responsibility. Now, I have to tread lightly. I don't want to say anything that's wrong. God, please. Um, I don't want to speak. I don't want to speak out of both sides of my mouth, okay? Um, I, when I read the account of Pharaoh, yes, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, we saw that, we see that scriptures, I believe it wholeheartedly. I believe in election. I believe it's true that we cannot come to, to, to being made alive in Christ, to becoming in Christ without the Holy Spirit enlightening us and enabling us to respond. I believe that with my whole heart. Um, there's still a little tiny piece of me that can't get away from the fact that if you read that through that, there were times that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and there were times that Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? So Pharaoh was complicit in the hardening, right? He was no puppet, okay? So we, we know that we need God's power and Holy Spirit to enlighten us uh, to come to him. Um, um, and, but we also see from our perspective that, that we, do need to, we do need to make a choice, right? Um, and we do need to take on that responsibility to join God uh, with what he's doing, with the works that he's doing. I know God enables us to join with him, but we still need to get on board with where God's moving. Um, so I don't know how it works. Is it all God's choosing and it's all his election? Uh, or is it God's election and man's responsibility? I don't know, <laughs> right? But I do know that God... Does he, he, he works it out. He works it out in, the, in, in, in heaven and, and I trust him to do that. Um, so that's, so that's the essence of the third objection. Um, verse 19, uh, one of you will say to me then, why does God still blame us for who can resist his will? Um, and then, so God goes on, uh, Paul goes on to give a reality check. <laughs> verse 20, 
But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, Why did you make me this way? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and making his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy? Whom he prepared in advance for his glory, even us, whom he also called, not only from Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Oh, oh yes. Oh yes, God, you are the potter. Uh, this is a great reminder of our place in the universe, right? God has us on his potter wheel. He's spinning us, right? Sometimes he's pounding us. Sometimes he's forming us. He's fashioning us. He's heating us up, right? All for his good purposes. All for his good, eternal, sovereign, glorious heavenly purposes. And we need to be so thankful that God loves us so much, right? He's shaping us. He's molding us for eternity. He's working all things for our good and his glory, right? We might feel like a lump right now, but we know that God will make us, he is making us something beautiful in eternity. So we can't dismiss God or blame God, right? His choosing. All of God's qualities are on display, in, in, in this doctrine of election, right? All his love, his mercy, his grace, his wrath, his justice, his patience, his long suffering, his kindness, his faithfulness, his power, right? These are all on display as God chooses what in his ways and for his reasons, we don't know, right? All of God's attributes are on display. And we might like some of God's attributes more than others, but we have to remember that every one of God's attributes are equally God. And God loves all of his attributes equally the same. Right? So should we. Right? It's hard though, right? And God will use everyone to display his glory. He used Abraham. He used Isaac. He used Ishmael. He used Jacob, Esau, Pharaoh, Moses, believers, non-believers, God's pur God purposes all things for his glory. And, and, and Paul brings in quotes from Hosea and Isaiah to, to, to reinforce the fact that he's not making this up, right? That, that there will be Gentiles that come into the kingdom. Not every Jew born of Jewish descent is saved, right? It's always been a remnant saved by faith. And Paul concludes with verse 30 to 33, he says, What shall we say then? Then Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it, not by faith, but at, by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Jesus is the stumbling stone. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Right? So you're telling me that the Jews who tried to get to God's righteousness, who tried to attain righteousness, they missed it. And the Gentiles who weren't even looking for it got it? Like, this doesn't make sense. How does this work? Right? Well, when it's all said and done, it's God. It's God that created heaven. It's God that made the way. Shouldn't we put our trust in how God says to get to heaven, right? He is the author and sustainer, a creator of heaven. So it makes sense to me that we would listen to him and how he says to enter the kingdom, right? But many stumble, many stumble over the claims of Jesus. I think, I think next year we're going to study the book of John and we're going to see that Jesus made a lot of claims while he walked the earth. He claimed to be God. He claimed to forgive sin. He claimed to be the only way to God. He claimed to be the good shepherd, the light, the bread of life, the source of living waters. He's the resurrection and the life. Um, and he just, you know, and at some point, you know, everyone, every single person that walks this earth will need to come to grips with the claims of Jesus, right? And to some, he will be the stumbling stone that is a barrier to them coming to God. And to others, he's the way, the truth, and the life. So we have to remember that, you know, God didn't, he didn't give up on us. He, he, he chose us. He pursued us. Um, and we look at what's going on uh, in, in Israel and, and God uh, as we look 
uh, at what God's Word says in the coming weeks and, and what uh, we see uh, in the nation of Israel. I mean, the very fact that uh, the nation of Israel still exists today after facing, you know, exterminations more than once. Um, and the fact that they, they can exist in um, uh, an environment where they are surrounded by people who hate them and are devoted to their annihilation. And even some of them have in the charter to actually destroy Israel, like the, their country's charter. And I go, how does this happen in the modern world? I don't know. Except that God, almighty, all powerful, that is total, the fact that Israel still exists today is total proof of the existence of God. And that it seems to me that God still has a plan for Israel. And so we're going to look ahead uh, in the weeks ahead. We're going to see that that, that we are living in exciting times and, and that God still has a plan. God has a plan for Israel uh, as we're moving forward, I think, I believe. And then God still has a plan uh, for us and, and, and the Gentiles. So amen. Amen.